Yes, Lord, we do pray that you would work a work in our hearts that would begin today through our brother Wes as he brings to our hearts, Lord, things that we need to learn, we need to know. Lord, I confess that I am way too myopic, way too nearsighted. When it comes to the kingdom of God, I only see pretty much what affects me, my little area of influence. And yet, Lord Jesus, you said to your disciples, lift up your eyes and look. There's a world out there that's hurting, that's being, uh, you know, overrun by the, 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 the devil's influence and power and people are dying. Give us grace, Lord, to stop being comfortable. Give us grace to step out of the boat like Peter. Give us grace to trust you for the miraculous in whatever time we have left. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Last service, I tried to read Wes's bio. Then I came to find out it was outdated, so I'm not going to even go there. Wes Bentley, I've known for many years. And in 1998, he founded a ministry that we have supported for many, many years, far-reaching ministry. Uh, in the beginning, it was like Africa was the focus, but now they're in 28 countries. And uh, I want you to be prepared to have your life changed. And I'm not saying that to be, you know, dra dramatic. If after what you hear this morning does not affect you, you need to pray that God would resurrect you. Because no true Christian can hear this and not be affected in some way. Even if it means you run home and start to pray like crazy. Doesn't mean you have to go to Africa. But you may. I don't know what God has for you. But I'm going to have Wes come and you'll understand what I'm saying when he's done. Come on up, Wes. Well, guys, uh, it's great to be here. I was actually supposed to be back in Africa, and which gave me the opportunity to be here. You know, the virus is affected there, too, and they've uh, shut down the nation. And uh, all of our operations are running overseas for the most part, but you cannot get in the country or out of the country right now until they have a better understanding there. Uh, it's been, I think, about 15 years since we've been here. And I want to give you a little bit of understanding before we get involved, uh, get into the message here. Uh, we have been involved in the longest running civil war in Africa, the war in southern Sudan. In the last 63, 64 years of the nation, we've had over 40 years of declared war, but there's really no time that we have not been fighting in the last 63, 64 years of the nation. Uh, last summer, South Sudan was upgraded to the third most dangerous nation in the world. Uh, I spoke with one of the generals over there that works in the intelligence, and he said that they are fighting five different armies, and there's 148 different rebel groups that are operational in the southern Sudan today. It's a very dangerous part of the world. Uh, folks, about 21, 22 years ago, uh, we became the official training arm for the South Sudan Army of training all pastors and chaplains for their military. Now, these are frontline combat chaplains. All of my men are armed. All of us go into battle. And I know that seems a little bit strange right now, but as we get in the message, I think you'll understand a little bit better. Uh, we get the guys up at 5 o'clock in the morning. We run them nine miles. Uh, we go straight up a mountain and straight down a mountain. And then we have eight hours of class time and two and a half hours of study time daily. Over the course of the time they're in school, uh, they'll go from Genesis to Revelations, but they'll also participate in four different types of ministry. Uh, they'll be in, in, involved in evangelical outreach. They'll be in charge of uh, for three months. Then they'll be just working within church, church ministry of how elders and people like that work together. Uh, they'll do uh, three months with children's ministry and three months with women's ministry. And we help to give them a rounded of understanding what it is to be a pastor when they get out in the field. We only feed the guys two meals a day of beans and corn maize. Uh, we give them meat about once every two weeks, and we could afford to feed them a lot better. But once they graduate, they're deployed to forward operation units in the South Sudan Army where we go into very heavy combat conditions. And if we don't train them hard, they will not survive. Uh, we're going to give you a little bit of understanding by showing you a couple photos first, and we'll bring those up here. This is the outside base of the Chaplain Compound in Southern Sudan. Uh, this doesn't give you any idea of how large it is. Over 700 people can live on that compound and sleep there. 
Uh, we designed it to look like a Jerusalem or a Crusaders castle with a particular purpose. There are literally no jobs in the Sudan other than the military, and that's why so many people are joining rebel groups. We're hoping to, uh, we're going to build 10 towers, 10 castle towers throughout the city, each with a different biblical scene on them. And we're hoping to bring in a lot of tourism so that in the next uh Somewhere between five and seven years, we hope to create thousands of jobs and start turning this nation around. Next one. This is uh, just a different part of the castle, so you get a little bit better of an image of what we're doing there. Next one. This is our church, uh, Calvary Chapel Cush in Nimely, South Sudan. Uh, these are just the adults. I mean, we got the children choir in front, but we have three services. The first is in English, the second is in Arabic, and the third is Mahdi, which is a local dialect. Uh, next one. These are the children. On a sunny day, we'll get about 1,800 kids. On a rainy day, we get about 1,200 because they all have to walk. Next one. These are the chaplains in both uh, dress uniform and field operation uniform. Next one. This here is a completely different facility in northern Uganda. It opened up in February of this year. It is a school for children, and uh, we're putting up long-range thermal imaging uh, cameras on the top of it. So if rebels are coming, we can intercept them and destroy them before they get to the kids. This here is the inside of the school. To, the, uh, to your left is the uh, dorms. To the right is uh, the classroom. Now, the facility is a lot bigger, but we just can't get it all in a, in a photo there. Next one. These are the guys. As you can see, they're pretty big boys. We train them pretty hard. Next one. In the center, in the uniform, is the president of Southern Sudan, Seba Kill. The man in the light blue jacket to his left is the commanding general of the South Sudanese Army. He's uh, one of my closest friends. I actually led him to Christ 21 years ago. I was the best man in his wedding. My wife, he's the maid of honor. And uh, he will probably be the president of the nation someday, folks. If this happens, he will probably declare the southern Sudan a Christian nation. I know of no other nation that will do that. We have actually prayed that Sudan will become a safe haven for Christians as we approach the last days. That as persecution rises in all other nations, which it's coming to America too, that people will be able to flee and live safely in the southern Sudan. So it's a long-term plan there. But the president came to our compound, this was February two years ago, and he said there is only one organization that is changing our nation and its far-reaching ministries. Now guys, there's a lot of good people over there, but that's the favor that God has given us. Uh, this morning in sharing with you, uh, I believe that being in Calvary Chapel that you're extremely well taught, really much better than most people. But I find that universally there's some things that are misunderstood in the body of Christ. For example, most of us understand that salvation is a free gift of God. We get that. But what a lot of believers do not understand is that the rewards of heaven are earned. And folks, if you never do anything for Christ in this life, why do you expect great treasure on the other side of eternity? The Bible says, in my Father's house there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would not have told you. But it doesn't say they're all mansions. It says there's many mansions. I've often wondered how many one-bedroom flats or two-bedroom condos are there. And I'd hate to get to heaven and find out that my flat on earth was much bigger than the one that I had in heaven because I never did anything to serve Christ. I believe that many of us, we begin, we come born again and we begin to travel what I call the narrow road. But I believe there was a road that God intended the church to travel, and I called it the road to Damascus. When Saul was on the road to Damascus before he would become Paul the Apostle, he was a Pharisee, he was very high up in the religious order, and he was persecuting Christians. He felt that this was a cult or a false belief. But on that road, he would have an encounter with Jesus Christ that would forever change his life, and he would literally never, ever be the same man again. If you know something about Paul the Apostle, folks, he was a brilliant man. He had a teacher by the name of Gamaliel. And Gamaliel talked a lot about Paul the Apostle, and he said the hardest things that he found was finding enough books for him to read. He authored many of the books of the New Testament, and I believe that God did that with him because he was such a brilliant man, probably tested at genius level. But guys, again, one of the things that you need to understand, I think Paul had great ambitions as he was traveling the road to Damascus. He was going to persecute the church. He wanted to be very high up in the religious order. Now, he could have not been the high priest because he was not a Levite. But as high as he could go, I think Paul had his ambition set there. But once he encounters Jesus Christ, his life is forever changed. He is never, ever the same man again. And I think about my own road to Damascus experience, folks. It did not come when I first got saved. 
I actually had lied about my age when I was in the 10th grade and joined the United States Marine Corps. I volunteered for combat duty in Vietnam, and I was a pretty highly trained soldier. I was deployed to an amphibious raider battalion, so I trained at the Navy SEAL base, the Army Ranger base, and we had our own specialized training. I was also a competitive shooter for the Marines. I used to shoot battalion and division matches. I was what was called a PMI, primary marksmanship instructor. And my coach actually said to me, he goes, Wes, you are so good with weapons, I think you could shoot the Olympics. Well, I never wanted to shoot the Olympics. I just wanted to shoot other people. So I never had any desire to go down that road there. But folks, as I, be, as I was traveling this road, you know, when the war got over in Vietnam, I decided to get out of the Marine Corps and go to Rhodesia and become a soldier of fortune. Fortunately, Christ would get a hold of my life, and it would change everything about me. And one of the things that I want to share with you, I, I, I'm the oldest of four boys in my family. My sister's the youngest of all five of us. All of us are former military. My father is former military. My brother, Rick, who's under me, followed me into the Marine Corps, also Special Forces. And Rick told my mom many years after I got saved, he said, you know, Mom, when Wes left, to join the Marine Corps. He goes, I did not want him to ever come back again. He goes, he was the meanest man I have ever met in my life. He goes, Mom, when he would fight people, he wouldn't just fight them. He would try to purposely injure them. He would try to hurt them. And folks, what it was is I, I don't know that I was trying to be so evil. My brother said that I was extremely cruel with my words towards everybody. That I do remember well. But I grew up where I was always having to fight, and it was never one against one, it was ten against one. So finally I went out and I got myself a German Mauser pistol, and I had a switchblade that was about that long, and I loved it because when I pushed the button, it would clack, and it would scare people to death. But when I would fight people, I would purposely beat them seriously, even after I'd won the fight, I wouldn't stop. And the reason I did it, I was just trying to send a message to people, leave me alone. And it worked quite well. But once I got saved, Rick said, you know, Wes changed so much, Mom, that I didn't want him to ever leave again. He was a completely different person. And this is what's supposed to happen to us. When we become a believer in Christ, the old life is to be lost. We are not that person anymore. We're not to represent the things of this world. So often believers, the reason we're not seen any different, <clears throat> the reason the world does not notice anything about us is we're trying too hard to fit into the world. We're trying to be like the world. You know, you see so many people, and guys, in some aspect, not all of this is wrong, but how many people try to identify with a motorcycle like Harley Davidson? That's their whole identity out there. Or a rock group, or something of that nature there. They wear the t-shirts, they wear the things that this says who I am. But when the Bible talks about the church, it says we are a holy people, a holy nation, a royal priesthood, a peculiar people. We were never meant to fit in. We were always to be completely separated from the world. And guys, I think about, I want to start by reading you a portion of Acts chapter 9 about Paul's conversion here. And as we get into this, uh, let me get to the thing. We're going to start in verse 1. It says, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and he asked her for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you per persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I'm Jesus whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you'll be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand in Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision. Ananias, yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. For he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles, the kings, and before the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house. He entered it, placing his hands on Saul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here has sent me that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up, was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Now, folks, many people believe that when this happened, this is where Paul the Apostle started his public ministry. But that's not what happened at all. 
For the next 13 to 14 years, Paul the Apostle disappears. We really don't know much about his life. The scripture is strangely silent in this area. We know for a time that he was in Arabia, but beyond that, we almost know nothing about his life. But what was ever happening, God was putting tremendously deep roots into his life. When he starts his public ministry, he will only have 22 years of public ministry before he is killed for his faith. Halfway through, he writes the second book of Corinthians. And in chapter 11, he talks about the suffering that he went through. And he says, five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with a rod. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from Gentiles, and danger from Jews, and danger in the city, and danger of the country, and danger from false brothers, and danger from bandits. I have labored and toiled and often gone without food. I've been cold and naked, and besides all these other things, I face daily my pressure and my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? Paul tells us that in the first 11 years of his ministry that he has been beaten nine times severely for the gospel. Folks, the reason the Jews gave you 40 lashes minus one is they used a whip called the cat and nine tails. Now, 40 lashes minus one meaning 39 lashes. It had a long rod with nine to 12 pieces of leather that hung down from it. Within the leather, there's pieces of bone, pieces of shell, and pieces of metal. And when you would hit someone on the back, it would literally grab the flesh and pull it right out of your body. Early historians describe it as being a massacre. And the reason they only gave 39 lashes is most men died at 40. Now, not everybody made it to 39. But as a general rule, at 39 you would live, and as a general rule, at 40 you would die. And Paul says five times that he had this, but he says of it, I count my life worth nothing if only I might finish the race which God has set before me. See, Paul was a man that was lost in Christ. His life truly did not belong to him. We are living in a generation where we are raising generations of effeminate men in America today. They do not understand their role anymore. They do not understand why they were created. And I'm going to come back to this here in a moment here. But I want to share with you folks about my own road to Damascus experience. It did not come when I first got saved. Matter of fact, I began to read the Bible as much as nine hours a day. But the first book that I read after the Bible was about six months later. I read a book called Tortured for Christ, written by Richard Wombram. He was a Romanian pastor that spent 14 years in prison for his faith, and he was tortured extensively. Now, folks, the Romanian government, communist government, could have easily killed him. But the reason they didn't, because he was a leader of the church in Romania, and they wanted to break him so they could break the church in Romania. And uh, I remember that he was speaking at a large church in Southern California. It was not a Calvary Chapel, but it was an outstanding church. The pastor of that church is one of the foremost theologians of our generation today, one of the most gifted men of God there is today. And when you go into the sanctuary, there's probably somewhere around 15,000 people that went to the church. And I remember that when Reverend Wombrat walks in, he walks in wearing his socks. And the reason he did that is because when he was in prison, they would often try to get him to deny his faith. He would refuse. So they would lay him across the table, take his shoes and socks off, and take a bat or a board and break all the bones in his feet. They did this on multiple occasions. His feet were so damaged that he chose always to walk in socks if he could. It was very painful for him. When he got up on the stage, he told some of the most incredible stories of persecution that I have ever had heard in my life. I actually have a good friend that worked for him for a number of years. He is a Calvary Chapel pastor. I'm also ordained as a Calvary Chapel pastor. <clears throat> and... Uh, and he said that one of the times that he was traveling with Richard Wombrat, they got caught in a rainstorm. He said, we got in the church, we were completely soaked, but we had our luggage with us. And the pastor said, Reverend Wombrat, quickly go into my office and change. You'll be on stage in five minutes. He said, when Richard Wombrat took off his shirt, you could see all the scars, all the cuts, all the places the body had been beaten so badly that the coloring never returned to its natural color. He said he had three cuts that ran from the top of his chest, down across his stomach, down to his waist. He said, but Wes, what I recognize the most, he had a round circle, about the size of a half a dollar, down on the right-hand side of his stomach, and it was also on his back, and it was black. And I looked at him and I said, Papa, what happened to you? He said, there was a time they tried to get me to deny my faith, and I refused to do it. So they took an iron poker and they heated it in the fire, and then they pushed it all the way through my body, but I refused to deny my faith. When Richard Wombrandt got done that day, folks, I said to myself, I am going to be the last person to leave this place. I don't care if it takes two or three hours. I need to understand this man's faith. But something would happen that day that would shock me more than anything that he had shared. 
Guys, literally within 10 minutes, the entire auditorium was empty. Now, there were three doors on the side, several at the back. I watched thousands of people walk past him and say, thank you, we'll pray for you. Not one of them did pray for him, and not one of them gave him a gift for his ministry. And I thought to myself, did these people not hear what I just heard? Did they not understand? Did they not perceive? I know their pastor. They are well taught. The Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. How could they just walk out and do nothing? So I went up to Reverend Wombrandt. I said, Reverend Wombrandt, I don't know how to help, but I would at least like to write a check. Who do I write the check to? And his wife, Sabina, said, Wes, write the check to Jesus. So I got out my checkbook, and I wrote a check for $180. Now, folks, it doesn't seem like a lot of money. But at that time in my life, it was probably all the money that I had. And then Sabina began to talk to me, and she said, You know, my husband spent many years in prison, but I also spent many years in prison. She goes, It was a very dark time in the history of Romania. If you were considered a threat to the state, there was no trial. All it took was for an officer to write an order, and they would take you out at midnight and shoot you in a firing squad. She said, we had a young 17-year-old girl in our cell that they had determined was a threat to the state. And they had written the order of execution. She goes, there was a great gloom within the cell because she was a young, beautiful Christian girl. And we could not understand what she had done. She said, but all of a sudden, this young girl spoke up and said, me and my fiance had hoped to glorify Christ in this life by being missionaries. But that is not how I shall glorify him. Tonight, I will glorify him with my death. She said, the girl's faith was so dynamic, it was like a light entered into the cell. And as they were marching her off to shoot her, she said it was a very radical scene. These two huge big bull of men, a tiny petite little girl, and they can hear her talking to these soldiers. And she says, I believe that Jesus Christ is the resurrection and the life. And he who believes in him shall never die. And they shot that young girl that night. And guys, that would forever change my life. I would never be the same man again. And I'm going to explain this in a moment. I'm going to come back to this, but I want to explain to you why. When I first went to Africa, I did not go there to be a soldier. Now, guys, I am trained as a soldier. I have been a soldier my entire life. But I didn't go there to be a soldier. You know, when you go into the ministry, the Bible says it's the love of God that compels people to repentance. We are supposed to reflect Christ's love to a lost world. We go out there by feeding the hungry, helping the poor, visiting those in prison, going to hospitals, meeting with people that are hurting and, and having compassion to understand and listen to their problems. We are there to teach God's word because that is the only answer for people's lives, to give them Christ's word. That's it. But the rebels began to come down and attack villages around us. One of the villages they hit they took 60 children and crushed their heads against trees. They would rape every girl from the age of nine years old and above. When they were done, the most beautiful women, they would take into sexual slavery. Some of these rebel leaders had 70 or 80 wives that they had abducted. They were their wives that they had taken from other men, their wives, their daughters, single women that had no parents or family. When they were done with them, the, the women they didn't want, most often they would just shoot them. But if they didn't shoot them, they cut their noses off, their ears, their lips, their fingers, their breast. They wanted to bring great terror to the people, and they were extremely effective about doing that. And the Lord told me, you have got to protect these women and children. So we began to build sanctuaries for the women and children to come in at night. When the sun would begin to set, at first you would see a trickle of women and children coming in. But by the time the sun went down, we estimated 44,000 women and children a night were coming in looking for sanctuary. Under every tree, under every veranda, they're trying to escape the rebels and the elements. Among the South Sudan army, there are great warriors. They're extremely tenacious in battle. But often they would fight extremely hard until they realized they could not win a battle. And when they realized they could not win a battle, they would pull back and say, live to fight another day. One of the villages that they pulled out of, me and my men went into right afterwards. The Islamic army had come down. They built these huge bonfires. And they picked up all the babies and toddlers, and they threw them in and they burned them alive. And when we got there, we could see the little cranials, the little spinal cords running throughout the ash of the fire. And the Lord told me, you've got to do something about this. So I set the men down and said, guys, I want you to understand something here. I go, 
It is not your job to save your life. It is your job to save their lives. We are men, they are women and children. If the enemy comes, not one of you guys is to pull off that line until we have evacuated every single woman and child. If you die, then you die. That is the role of a man. We are called to protect those who cannot protect themselves. We are called to care for those that do not have the ability to care for themselves. We know the tactic of the enemy. They do not hit hard targets. They don't come with 200 men and fight 200 men. They're cowards. They come with 200 men and they fight where there's five men. So if they come with 200 men one day and there's only five of us, just know this is the day you're going to go home to meet the Lord. And you stand and you fight to the last man. Because in doing so, maybe another 10 or 20 women and children will escape. See, I don't know if you've ever seen a child that's truly terrified before, folks, but the most vivid image in my mind was of a little girl. She was probably about three and a half years of age. I'm not exactly sure. And she was a little away from the thing. She was in the beginning stages of starvation. When Africans starve to death, their hair turns red and orange. They become ashen white. They become emaciated. Folks, when people are starving to death, they begin to hallucinate. And when we found her, her mother had been killed in a rebel attack. She was still holding on to the dead body of her dead mother. And I remember walking over and picking this little thing up and putting her in my wife Vicky's lap. And every part of her is shaking. Her arms, her chest, her stomach, her thighs, her calves. Everything is trembling. See, what this little girl understands that many of us do not is that in southern Sudan and northern Uganda, monsters are real and they come to kill. And the heart that we have for these children is to be able to say to them, Honey, you lay your head down tonight and you sleep and you dream the dreams that a child is supposed to dream. Nobody's going to hurt you tonight. Not on my watch. Tonight the body of Christ is going to wrap its arms around you and we are going to protect those that cannot protect themselves. See, one of the problems today is we're living in a generation where we are raising feminine men in America. Men do not understand their roles anymore. I was on a plane in Fort Lauderdale probably four years ago, and this NFL star gets on the airplane. And guys, I don't know who he is. I don't have time to follow this, but everybody else knows who this guy is. But I remember when he gets on there, he's, he's got a Louis Vuitton over his shoulder, and I like the guy to go, isn't that a purse? He goes, no, it's a bag. I said, well, my sister has the same one, and she calls it a purse, you know. <laughs> but see, this is the generation we're living in. We are raising generations of effeminate men today. Men are so into fashion today. Why was that ever supposed to be important to us? Why were we ever supposed to care about that? I mean, folks, I believe that we should dress appropriately. Don't get me wrong. I believe it's nice to look nice, especially for your spouse. But when a young men spend more time grooming themselves than women do, there is something wrong with this generation. We were made for battle as men. We were made to be in the thick of it. And we were made to protect those that do not have the ability to protect themselves. We had a rebel unit that was probing our village about four years ago, probably between 1,000 and 1,200 men. And guys, when they come from these villages, they come to loot, they come to kill, they come to rape, they come to destroy. And we knew they were out there. Our scouts had spotted them, but they were elusive. Every time we spotted them, they'd fade right back into the bush. So I had to deploy the men into the field. Every night we went out at 7 o'clock, and we would not come back until 4 o'clock in the morning. And my standing order was, intercept them and kill them all. Don't you let a single one of them get away. Now, I've had a lot of people say to me, Wes, what about turn the other cheek? Well, turn the other cheek means take an offense for the gospel. Never meant to let them rape your wife, your daughters, to sell them into sexual slavery, to butcher children, to burn them alive. That's not what the scripture ever meant. Now, guys, if they surrender, will I take them prisoner? Of course I will. But I will not stand by and watch them murder innocent women and children. As men, we have a God-given right to protect them. See, when you're preaching the gospel, if you're preaching the gospel and someone comes and shoots you, that's dying as a martyr for Christ. But as men, we're not supposed to stand around and let them hold just butcher our families. It's not supposed to happen. As a soldier, you really do see Scripture in a different light. I think about King David. When King David wanted to build the temple of the Lord, God sends the prophet Nathan to him and he says, David, the Lord said, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war. You're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. 
The folks, I suspect if I was to try to build a temple, the Lord would send a prophet to me and say, Wes, it's good that it's in your heart to do this. But you're a man of war, you're a man of blood. You cannot build my temple. The great thing is, folks, is I can build this church. And I'd much rather build a church than build a temple. I want to come back to this young lady now, folks, and explain why this affected me so much. I have heard generals of the South Sudanese army talk to me about, with other generals and other people, and say, this man is an extremely serious soldier. He knows exactly what he's doing in combat. And I do. You see, she was a young girl, really just becoming a woman. She's 17 years old. She's getting ready to get married. And while I'm a soldier, I'm not unaware of how young women think about marriage. They dream about it their whole life. It seems to be so much more important to the women than it is the men. They dream about the ceremony, the exchanging of the vows, the wearing of the dress and the veil, the intimacy that they will share with their husband, the children that will be born, and the life and ministry that she could have had. And all it would have taken for that young girl to have that was to say, I deny Christ. But she chose to die. She died 60 years ago, but her legacy lives on. And I said, Lord, if a young woman who's 17 years old can give so much for Christ, I'm a man of war. I handle combat quite well. How much more should my life count for the gospel? And folks, we have to ask ourselves, have we ever given anything in our life that's actually cost us? Have you ever financially given to your church where it's actually cost you? I mean, you pay your tithing and that's great. But have you ever given where it's ever cost you? Have you ever done a ministry that you didn't want to do? A lot of people get into music ministry because they love music, and I'm not saying it's bad, guys. But if you love music and you do it, what price did you really pay? How about doing child care? You know, I remember many years ago, I went to Horizon School of Evangelism with Mike McIntosh. And I remember that one Wednesday night, a woman did not show up for child care. And Mike got up and said, well, you asked for someone to volunteer. Well, I was not going to volunteer. I figured... Some woman out there would raise her hand, but none of them did. And finally, I got a little uncomfortable, so finally, I raised my hand, and I got the four-year-olds. I would rather be back in Sudan being shot at than ever go through that again. If I ever do child care again, I'm taking a gun with me. I think it's only fair. But my point being is, have you ever done something that you didn't want to do? Have you ever shared your faith when you weren't sure if it was safe? It's never safe where we're at. King David said, I will not give to the Lord what costs me nothing. See, if your faith doesn't cost you, what have you stored in treasure? What treasure have you stored in heaven? I want to share with you about one of our chaplains in the last three weeks of his life when he was killed. His name is Peter Guy. And guys, you're going to see him on a video up here in a moment. He's uh, You'll recognize him because he's got a large gap between his two upper front teeth. I don't know why, but in East Africa, Southern Sudan, Kenya, Uganda, if you have a large gap between your two upper front teeth, you're considered a very handsome man or a very good-looking woman. I don't don't know why. It's just part of the culture over there. If you're thin, they don't think you're very good-looking. If you're overweight, they think you're great-looking over there. I told my wife, I said, honey, you got to be careful. I said, I'm like the Fabio of our village out here, you know, (laughs) just very different. But I remember, guys, that we got news from the front that Peter had been killed. We actually lost three guys that day. What happened was the enemy launched a massive offensive. They came down with 7,000 soldiers. Peter's unit was the first one scrambled and sent to attack while other units were being assembled. They hit them headlong, but they only had 700 men against 7,000. They fought three major battles. 300 men were killed. There were 400 men left. There was an ominous feeling among all the men that everybody was going to die. And they were correct. Every single one of them was going to die. The only reason we know what happened is we had a fourth chaplain, his name was also Peter, and he was sent out as a runner a couple days before the final battle. And he told us, he said, Peter was really suffering in the last days of his life. He said, well, he goes, a month before Peter died, his wife left him for another man. He said he was heartbroken. He couldn't understand. He couldn't wrap his head around it. He said, but the men in our unit did not know it. He goes, I would watch Peter. He would go out there. He would take his Bible and he knew what was coming and he would sit down with 20 soldiers on a log and open up the Word of God. 
30 minutes later, all their heads would go down and he'd lead them to Christ. And then there'd be five and 10 and 15 and another 20. And when he was absolutely exhausted, he would come back and suffer in silence with us. He'd say, I don't know why she left. I loved her. I don't know what I did wrong. Because he didn't do anything wrong. She just chose the world. He said, a week before he was killed, his sister called him and said, Peter, your wife has left you. You need to live in the military and come home and take care of your family. And Peter responded, he said, first of all, I'm a soldier in the South Sudan Army. If I were to leave, it's desertion, which is punishable by firing squad. He said, but far beyond that, in the book of John, Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go. He goes, I was chosen by God to be here at this place and time, and I will not leave my post. We were in communication with him just before the last battle. And the last transmission we got was, we see a large army arrayed against us. We will call you after this battle. Call never came. All 400 men were killed. We have never recovered the body of Peter or other two chaplains. They lie among some 700 men whose bodies are no longer distinguishable by the ravages of war. But guys, I have often thought about when Peter crossed over. See, Peter didn't just cross over by himself. He crossed over with 400 men that he led to Christ. Whatever the heartache, the suffering, or the betrayal, he is a prince in the kingdom of God, and his reward will be great. When we read the story of the ten minas, it says God gives a mina to three different men. One bears ten, one bears five, and one buries it in the ground. To the one that bears ten, he says, you'll be in charge of ten cities. To the one that bears five, he says, you'll be in charge of five cities. To the one that bears it in the ground, he says, take it away and give it to the one that has ten. They said, but sir, he already has ten. He goes, I tell you that to everyone who has more will be given. That is, the one has nothing, even what he has will be taken away. And guys, what this scripture is talking about is bearing fruit or winning souls for the kingdom of God. Now, it's strange to think, and I've talked to many theologians about this. I've studied this scripture quite extensively. I was in Mexico a year and a half, two years ago with David Guzak teaching a conference. And David's quite the theologian. And I said, how do you see the scripture? He said, you know, I believe that it's very possible that we will rule over cities in the kingdom of God. Much like the British Empire, when they had colonies all over the world, they'd have a viceroy over Kenya, Uganda, the Sudan, will be viceroys in the kingdom of God. You know, guys, 98% of all believers will never lead one single person to life in their Christ. That's a statistical fact. I often ask people, I say, well, do you share your faith? And they'll say, well, it's not my gift. I said, you know, that's interesting because the scripture says, go into the world and make disciples of all men, unless it's not your gift. Only it doesn't say that, does it? See, being good at something isn't a reason why, whether to do it or not. My son is not good at cleaning his room. I still require him to do it. Guys, God expects us to be faithful. We are to look for every opportunity to share our faith. We are supposed to be about the Father's business. You know, guys, I've seen a lot of men die over the years, and I think before I went to Africa, I'd only seen, I don't think I ever saw one die right there in front of me. I, I've been to funerals where I'd seen people that passed away. But after almost 24 years in the South Sudan, I have seen many, many people die right there in front of me, take their last breath. When men get shot in battle, they don't normally die right away. I mean, it happens ever so often, but as a general, you bleed out. It hits a critical area. There's no proper medical. And sometimes it could take hours. I suspect that Peter did not die in the first moment that he was shot. I suspect that in the last moments of his life, he was saying, Father, forgive my wife. I love her. Bring her to faith. I suspect that's what his life was about because he lived the way a man of God was supposed to live. You know, folks, I was talking to one of the um, brothers out there just before the service. He says, you know, we're going to put this out on the Internet. He says, you know, there are people out there that, he goes, is that okay? And I said, yeah. And he goes, well, there's people out there that will think that we're crazy because of this passage. I said, guys, don't worry about it. I said, I get this every single weekend. See, the Bible says the gospel is an offense to those who are perishing. They will always 
put us in with the crazies because they don't want to hear the message. They're offended by the gospel. And if they're out there and they're offended, they should be take note that they're probably on their way to eternity without Christ. We have this thought in our mind that you hit bottom and there's no place that you can go lower. Guys, after all these years in South Sudan, there's no truth in that at all. We begin to have rebels come in our area and capture families. And African families are normally four, five, six, seven children. That's a general rule. But it's not uncommon for them to be 11, 12, or 13. What began to happen was rebels began to capture families, and they would normally take a little girl, a little boy of 9 or 10 years old, and give them a machete and say, cut the head off your mother. And if the child refused to do it, they'd say, if you do not cut the head off your mother, we're going to cut the head off your father, your mother, your brothers, and your sisters, and then we're going to kill you. And mothers would beg their children to kill them. I have counseled many of these children, and there is absolutely no English ability to explain to you what that's like. We just don't have words for it. We don't understand this type of suffering. One of the things that I know about men like Peter, the Bible says the eye is not seen, the ear is not heard, the mind cannot conceive the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Is he in charge of 400 cities? I don't know. But I know his reward will be great. You know, guys, the Bible says that when we go to heaven, God is going to wash away every sorrow and every tear. And for years, I've heard people say, well, that's for the loved one that did get saved. The parent that re rejected Christ, the brother, the sister, the wife, the husband. I don't think it's what it is at all. I think it's when we see the lives that we could have had and we chose not to have. That's where God's going to have to wash away the suffering, realizing that it could have been so much more for Jesus Christ. We're going to show you a video here. The first part of it is about the Syrian church. Now, guys, we're operating in seven of the ten most dangerous Islamic countries. We have a division of our ministry called Ghost Operations. It's the invisible hand in the closed world of radical Islam. In the first part of it, you will see what the Syrians are going through. And it's hard to watch, but it's inspiring. The second part, you'll see all the chaplains that have been killed in ministry. And remember Peter Guy with the gap. Let's go ahead and show that, guys. When the war starts, many problems happen, and it's so difficult to continue the ministry. And uh, we know some some day uh, the problems is come inside our homes, not just in our city or in our area. Uh, at that time, I speak to the leaders, and uh, we met together, and I said, as in Acts book. The believers, when they have the persecuted, most of them, they go out of Jerusalem. If you want not to go out of your area or out of Syria to save your families, this is good if God gave you this to do. But uh, we, we must to know, maybe one day the problems come to our families and to our life. And maybe we will lose our life one day. You know, when I left the room and after the time I turned back to see the decision of the leaders, I found 25 people. They stand there and they said, we will not leave, we will continue to serve God here in this area and we will continue the ministry. If we are die, we will go to Jesus. And if we leave here, we will be with Jesus. And you know, but they asked me something to do. They said, if one of our team die, you know we are not Christian background, and no one will take care about our body if we killed or something happened to us. Uh, what we can do if this happened? For that, we buy this land and we build a graveyard. This graveyard, for if anyone killed from our team, we can put him there. This is the first building of our ministry. I think it first uh, happened in Arraqqa city in Syria. They give the chance for the uh, Christian. They said to him, if you leave your Christianity uh, all your life, or if not, we will kill you. This, this decision is, you, you know, it must 
to, to, to take directly. And most of the Christians said, no, we are ready to die for Jesus. And for that, they, uh, you, you can see many uh, pictures about the Christian. They put them in the cross. And when they put them, many times they put in the area, all the people can see them. To learn the people, if you will be Christian, this is your what will happen to you. Uh, and uh, most of the people, I thank God for these uh, heroes in the faith. They die for Jesus and they put them in the cross. You remember when I told you about the stories about the man who uh, was his son and uh, they bring them and they ask them to leave uh, them faith in Jesus Christ. But the father said no and the son said no. And they ask the father, if you don't uh, come to Islam now, we will, we will kill your son from the fewer, your eyes. And after that, they cut the head of the son and they start to play football in his head, front of his father's eyes. This is something incredible. You cannot understand what's happened. But through all this bad news, you can see the hope is growing between these uh, uh, difficult and uh, bad people. You know, some, sometimes many people ask me why, why you continue the ministry in Syria, especially in this time in the war. The important things for, uh, for our life to be in God willing. This is our call from God to, uh, to do the ministry in Syria. When we are inside the, the God willing, that means we are in the safe place. But if we are go out of God willing and go out of Syria, that means we are in the dangerous place. Maybe I, I can go like to Lebanon, to Jordan, to US, to, to anywhere and continue my life there. But that means I am go out of God willing. That means I am in dangerous. The important things in our life, not to be alive, but to be with Jesus willing. But if I am in, inside the dangerous, but in God willing, that means I am in the safe place. This is my belief and I trust in Jesus. He will keep my life and when he wants me to go to him, I am ready to do this.
That number has risen to 24. We have now lost 64 men in the service of Christ in the South Sudan. And we're going to lose many more. We're not over with, folks. As a believer, I, I know that a lot of what we say seems to shock the body of Christ. Because we're not trying to shock you. We're trying to educate you. Um, I don't even really share the bad stories with you. And I know that may seem very strange to you. But one of the things that I've shared with the body of believers, I, I have never had a problem with having to take human life. Now, don't misunderstand me. I do not enjoy killing. I never have and I never will. But when men come to rape women and children, to burn them alive, to cut them up, to sell them into sexual slavery, we're going to do exactly what it takes to stop them. And we're not apologetic about it at all. We have a God-given right to protect women and children. I don't think we really know what it means to count the cost of following Christ. You know, I, I do a lot of reading, and I, I have five libraries, three, two at my home and three at my office, and I do a lot of reading of secular history, too. Like right now, I'm reading a book on the legions of Rome, uh, the Knight Templars, uh, Genghis Khan, and on Stalingrad. And I was reading about the Knight Templars. The Knight Templars lived a thousand years ago, folks, and a lot of people say, well, Wes, are you defending the Catholic Church? I said, well, first of all, a thousand years ago, the Catholic Church was the church. And the bottom line, folks, is the church has always been the church. In every denomination, you'll find true believers and false believers. I met a Catholic church when I first went to Sudan some 20-some years ago. And he'd been in the Sudan for 30 years. And guys, I don't agree with this doctrine, but there was no doubt that man loved Christ. And to the best of his ability, he was trying to reach people with the love of God. I've met Calvary Chapel pastors that are adulterers fornicators, thieves, robbing from the church, pedophiles. And I know of one Calvary pastor that actually got a woman pregnant and killed her to hide it. See, the Bible says a tree is known by its fruit. A good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree bears bad fruit. You know, when people criticize our ministry, I don't respond to it. I really don't. I said, guys, the more you defend yourself, the more guilty you look. I said, we'll do the work and let the fruit speak for itself. We're not going to get into this game that these people play. They try to draw you into it. I don't have time for it. But when you became a Knight Templar, you chose a life of celibacy. You were never allowed to marry. You were never allowed to have any material position. You could even have a ring. You, were, you wore the white robe with the red cross, the white shield with the red cross. You had your armor and your things to fight with, your seer, spear, swords, and battle axes. And the job of a Knight Templar was to protect God's people, the Holy Church, and Jerusalem. A thousand years ago, when people were making pilgrimage to Jerusalem, Arabs were raiding them, murdering them, raping them, selling them into sexual slavery. And it was the job of the temple to protect them. When Saladin was marching with his army to retake Israel, 140 knights found out about it and they set out to intercept him. But he was not alone. He was with 7,000 Saracen soldiers. And one day's march behind him was over 100,000 men. Some of the knights wanted to turn and leave. They said, you know, we, we, we can't fight him. Where 140 men get 7,000. But there was a knight by the name of Gerard, and Gerard said, listen, men, whether we live or we die, we will be with Christ. And 140 knights attacked 7,000 thousand Saracen soldiers. They were utterly destroyed. The last knight to fall was a man by the name of James of Malise. And when all the other knights had been killed, 
He mounted his horse and he charged a thousand Saracens. The Saracens were so taken by his bravery, they begged him to surrender. They said, we will not harm you. We will not imprison you. We will not torture you. We will set you free. Just stop. But James was sworn to protect, so he fought until they killed him. The Muslims were so taken with the bravery, they thought that they had killed a Christian saint. The interesting thing about the story, folks, is this is not a part of Christian history. Christians were all dead. This is a part of Islamic history. The Bible says, let your light so shine before men that they see your heavenly Father. See, as God's holy church, we are to live lives above reproach. One of the things that troubles me so much is we are lowering the standard in the church all the time. I've heard many pastors get up and say, if a man says he doesn't lust for other women than his wife, he's a liar. Now, I don't know what Bible you're reading because I happen to read the Holy Scripture. And the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. And guys, I can tell you with absolute honesty, I don't lust for other women. I love my wife. I adore her. And she's the delight of my life. But see, I don't watch myself in the things of the world. I don't watch television and movies and read the articles written by the world. I watch myself in God's Word. And the Bible says daily there's a renewing of the mind. Daily there's a conforming to the image of Christ. And as you wash yourself in God's word, he transforms. You know, I was telling your pastor last night that I probably have a dozen young girls around the world that have kind of adopted me as a father because they didn't have a good father figure. I didn't really adopt them. They more adopted me. But one of my staff members said to me, he goes, you know, Wes, I noticed that young girls always feel safe around you. I said, that's because I look at them from the neck up and not the neck down. Most Christian men, they don't even realize it. They'll look at a young, pretty girl and they give them a once-over. They don't even realize they're doing it. Tells them something about your character. See, we're to live above reproach. That's why we are a peculiar people. You know, guys, you're very fortunate. You have a pastor that has a pastor's heart. I thought about being a pastor once, but I realized you had to like people, and I thought, well, it's just not going to work for me. You know? <laughs> Probably better than I'm a foreign missionary, you know. But you have a pastor that has a pastor's heart. So the Bible says, to whom much has been given, much shall be required. As believers, I don't know what the greatest desire of your life is, but I will tell you what the greatest desire of mine is. And folks, when I share this, I'm not doing this for grammatic reasons. I don't care about your praise or accolades. They really don't mean anything to me. One of my staff members, Edward, we, we get several letters every week that come into office and, and always thanking us for the ministry and, and seeing our praises. And Edward would come and say, hey, you got four more letters you want to read? And I said, no, you can read them. He goes, you don't want to read them? I said, well, he goes, do you care? And I said, I said, I'm thankful that they're blessed, Edward, but I don't care about the accolades. They don't mean anything to me. But I've had an impression from the Lord for a long time <clears throat> that I will not live out my natural life. I suspect at some point I'm going to be killed in the South Sudan. And when that day comes, guys, and I stand before a holy God, I want to look into his eyes and hear him say, well done, son. Well done. Enter into the joy of thy Lord. See, we are to be God's holy people. We're to represent him. We're not here to represent ourselves. I actually had a Hollywood producer meet with me and try to get me to do a movie. Lily spent 10 hours with me and Vicki. He wanted to make me into some kind of a Christian Rambo. And I told him no. He said, Wes, I'm giving you what everybody dreams of. I said, everybody who's carnal. The Bible says that no flesh shall glory in the presence of God. I've had many people try to get me to write a book, folks, and I refuse to do it. Now, I understand the value of it, and if the Lord ever tells me to, I will do it. But see, I kind of feel like we have the only book we really need right here. This is it. Everybody wants to write their book. Everybody wants to leave their mark. But we don't represent ourselves. We represent Christ the kingdom. He's the one that we leave the mark on. I don't want to leave them with the mark of West Bentley. I want to leave them with the mark of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to build his kingdom. And guys, I want to encourage you. You need to start sharing your faith. Now, I'm going to challenge you, and I want you to go home and think about this. But every one of you should go out there and invite someone to church every Sunday. And guys, you know, sometimes when I'm sharing my faith, I'll go out and God will take me from A to Z. 
I'll start sharing the gospel and they'll end up praying with me right there at the end of it. But there are times that I'll go up to people and say, hey, John, uh, I used to be an extremely violent man. And someone invited me to Calvary Chapel and it just changed everything. Why don't you come out Sunday and I'll take you out to lunch afterwards. You'll be surprised if you do it every week how many people will come and how many will stay. Folks, there's a world of people out there that are lonely. They're desperate. They have no hope. And they may look confident on the outside, but they are dying on the inside. And they need to hear that God loves them. I've had men that look like they're absolute warriors and fear nothing. And you start explaining that Christ loves them, and they just start weeping because they can't deal with their sin. They know that they've offended. They know that there's something accountable for them. But start inviting them to church. Take them out to dinner afterwards or to lunch. Pick them up if they need be. We all know there's certain people that are kind of the outcasts of society. Nobody likes them. Nobody wants to be with them. They're not popular. Maybe they're, they don't think they're attractive or good looking. I don't know what this is about the church that we care about that. But as believers, those are the very ones we should go to. The handicapped. Those that the rest of the world doesn't seem to care for. God loves them. In closing this morning as you leave, we want to give you a couple opportunities, but I'm going to tell you right up front, you cannot take this out of your church tithing. If you want to do this, it has to be a gift above and beyond to the Lord. We've taken on 700 pastors in the underground in the Middle East from Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, Iraq. We're in the areas of Hezbollah, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and many of the other radical Islamic organizations. Ghost operations, we have 700 pastors. We're probably close to 300 that are fully supported and partially supported on the others, but we need 700 of them that are fully supported. And we, a lot of these guys, this is all the money they're getting. We have to raise about three sponsors per pastor to get them fully supported. And then uh, with the sponsorship, at $75 a month. I can give you no information other than what's on this card. You will receive no update on them unless they're killed. We have tremendous secrecy around this. Folks, we found out that Al-Qaeda was following our website. We've had two of our missionaries on Al-Qaeda kill sites. A kill site is where they say, put up a picture of you and say, kill on site. So we can't put anything on our website. But if you'd like to sponsor one, it's $75 a month. And then we have our chaplains. Most of my guys speak between four and seven languages. Some of them speak 13. All of them are in frontline combat units. It's also 75 to sponsor one of these. And then we have our children of war. Today we've got children from Liberia. A lot of these are orphan children. Parents were killed. A lot of parents just left because they were so in despair. And it's $50 a month to sponsor the children. And we pay for everything. Their food, their housing, their clothing. They cost them nothing to go to school. Uh, if you decide to do this, you have to pick it up and fill, fill out the form. If you take these and walk away with them, I won't know if they're sponsored because they're all numbered. And we have too many people in the system. What you do is you give us your name, address, phone number, sign it at the bottom. Voided checks work best because we don't pay fees, but you can use debit or credit card. And guys, a lot of people want to do it. They go, well, I didn't bring anything. No problem. Pick out what you want, fill it out, sign it. We'll call you later for the financial information. People ask this of me every week, so I'm going to just say this. And I, we're not asking anybody to do this, but I've had people say, well, what if I want to sponsor all three? Well, it's $200. But again... No matter what you sponsor, if you cannot afford to do it as a gift above and beyond without touching your tithing, then I would ask that you don't do it. We're a very strong organization. We're very large. It's not that we might receive, but that you might store your treasures in heaven. I'm going to ask your pastor to come up and close in prayer, but I want to say this one last thing to you. You've been given this one precious life to serve Christ. If you throw it away, you will not get a second chance. Guys, there are supposed to be defining moments in our life, things that happen that define who we are. As an athlete that goes out to play professional ball or something, at some point in his career of his athletics, he, he realizes, I, I'm defined, I can do this. And then he pursues it. But as believers, there's times that the Holy Spirit speaks to our heart and says, you were created for something greater. And that doesn't mean that you go to the South Sudan. I doubt there's anyone here called to go there. And you should never go there unless you are called. But it does mean that you're supposed to go across the street. You know, guys, me being in Sudan doesn't make me more of a spiritual person. 
I don't function well in America. I don't like living here. It's not home to me anymore. My home is over there. When I'm back in America, I go across the border to Mexico a lot because I just, it's just not home to me. God created me for it. But for most of you, he created you to live in this community and be a light to a lost world. Pastor Phil, God bless you guys.